So today's topic, we're going to talk about this HPV Oncotec 3DX as an old diagnostic approach for precise pre-cervical cancer detection. So this is part of uh, the whole currency, or current of um, thinking of precision medicine for diagnostics and treatment. And here we have this an example of personalized cancer therapy, but this applies <coughs> also to diagnostics. So the aim is to identify groups of patients profiting the most from personalized diagnostics or treatment. So for this, we have developed technological alliances, especially with a company called Incel DX here. And uh, so Bruce Patterson, I should have here on behalf of him, he's a very good uh, researcher from Stanford University. And he has developed a series, a battery of different tests. And today we're going to talk about the HPV Oncotec 3DX. So this is um, the contents for today's talk. we we'll start with a small introduction, and then we'll talk about the current diagnostics of HPV infection and risk assessment, biotransformation and oncogenesis at the molecular level, and the triage of HPV infection to detect the disease using this new test, and conclusions. So first of all, I want to start uh, telling you that I did my PhD at the Heidelberg University and the Department of Tumor Biology. And I just pointed out this because I was very happy and very um, honored to have the opportunity to meet a person I admire a lot. So he is uh, Dr. Harald Zuhausen. He has an amazing story of perseverance, and this is for another time because it's a very long story, but it's very interesting because, uh, well, I was there exactly at the time he, when he got the Nobel Prize, so I was among the group of first people like shaking hands with him. I didn't watch the one to watch by hand after some time. And it was really, uh, really a pleasure to be there at the time of being, uh, so like, seeing history happen. So he was awarded the Nobel Prize for he discovered the human papilloma viruses causing cervical cancer, chaired with Francois Vargas Inoussi, Francois, sorry, and Lou Montagné for the discovery of HIV. So this is the virus, and here from now I just want you to keep in mind that we have a circular, covalently closed circular DNA. We have the L1 gene, the L2 gene, this, the L1 is against which the vaccine is di directed, and then we have the oncogenes, the oncogenes here, this E6 and the E7. Well, how does it happen, this uh, transformation? So the infection could happen here at the basal layer, so it could happen through microabrasions, or during, um, here at the sun of the transition between the squamous epithelium and the cuboid cells here. So this is where the epithelial cells, so these basal epithelial cells, are exposed, and then the virus, the virus can infect the cell and start to uh, proliferate. And of course, this causes around 500,000 of uh, cancer, cervical cancer every year, and this leads to approximately 300,000 of deaths every year. So we have two different, two special types, so like the squamous cell carcinoma and the adenocarcinoma. So this is 10%, and the squamous cell carcinoma is about 90%. And this is the natural history of HPV infection. This follows the inverted iceberg concept of infection. So this is, uh, these are numbers for the US, but they apply also to other places in the world. So here we start with 10 million cases of, sub, you know, of estimated subclinical HPV infections. <coughs> From there, we have 1,400,000 cases, 400, cases of low-grade dysplasia, then from there, we go down to 300,000 cases with high-grade dysplasia, and in the end, we have only 11,000 cases of cancer. So what happens with all the rest? We have, then, a spontaneous reg re regression. So that means that in most of the cases, the immune system of the women is able to remove, to, to clear the infection, right? And only in the end is when you need the surgical treatment. But now the question, would be what happens if we ask a woman who is here and we tell, we tell her, you have a high risk HPV infecting you. So she would immediately think, I will die. I will have cancer. Yeah? But in the end, the numbers are very low. So is there the possibility that we are maybe over diagnosing? and even over-treating some patients. So we're going to address these questions in the talk. 
for that, I want just to review the current diagnostics. And here we have the normal thing. We have the screening, the cytology with ASCUL, CELCIL, ACIL. We have the confirmation with the histology. We have normal histology, seen one, two, three, or cervical cancer. And here we have the infection going on, and we have here cancer, right? So this is the normal thing that you all know much better than me. But look at the numbers. After one year of infection, there's an 80% of priorities to have clearance. After two years, 90% like of priority to have clearance. And if we, ha we, we have a look here, and we make a zoom of this, we have this information of invasion versus persistence. So in the end, we have only 20% of SYN3 <coughs> progressing to cancer in five years. And 50% of SYN3 progress to cancer in 30 years. Okay? So there's, there's time, most of the cases. Okay, of course, the medicine has created this system with the histology, especially the sin, this is a lot used in many countries, the cytology, also you know much better than me, and now we have the molecular testing. So in the molecular testing, we have normal cervix or we have the HPV infection. And indeed, I'm on this new test, so we have all these DNA-based tests. They are very sensitive to uh, detect infection. So like, we have very early infections, and they can be detected with HPV, uh, like high-risk HPV DNA testing. Okay. We will see that later, this RNA testing. But then it comes the question, are maybe these DNA tests too sensitive? And this is a Spanish study done with the COVAS. And here you can see that you can detect down to 40 14.8 uh, cells and 158 <coughs> copies of the virus. So they're really sensitive. Another study showed that DNA can be detected outside the cells. It can be detected even in the environment. So in the study, when they started to, to, to look the, for the HPV DNA in fomit samples, so they found it in almost 18% of fomit samples. So DNA testing, so HPV contamination also was 2.7 times more frequent in gynecology private practices than in hospitals. And the samples were the black lamp, blood blood blocks, white lamp, colposcope handle, and the lubricant steel. On top of that, this is a comparison of the FDA approved technologies. Here we have the hybrid capture, we have the CLART, we have the COVAS, and now we have the Aptima. And if you see that, the concordance among these tests is only 29%. So what are we really looking at? So we have many false positives and false negatives re uh, respect to each other. And no method is approved to use in women under 25 to 30 years old, where we ha can have like more or less 10% of cervical cancer. Indeed, when we look here in gray, we have HPV infection, in red, we have SYN2, and here we have the cytological status. You said that even for HCL, you have huge gaps of women having HPV infection, but not having disease. So, and you see that even more for the low grade. So this is the same concept of uh, inverted iceberg. And here's to tell you that the definitive diagnosis by histology is neither a good predictor. So you can see here the numbers. A woman in SYN1 in a period of 12 to 12, 24 months, only 1% only of women will progress to invasion. In SYN2, only 5% will progress to invasion. And in SYN3, more or less 12%. So we have here similar kind of information, but here we have the normal, SYN1, SYN2, and SYN3. And here we can have the ratios of the women, like having a spontaneous regression after one year. Like from SYN1, we have like 57%, 33% will persist, and only 11% will progress. In SYN2, we have 43%, then 35%, and 22% will progress. And even SYN3 is already known because of the very unethical study that was done in New Zealand, uh, that 32%, we can have up to 32% spontaneous regressions. And this is a study derived from corposcope biopsies. 
So the question here is, who is progressing and who is regressing? So that's the important question. And for that, we will review the molecular biology of the viral infection and viral transformation oncogenesis by HPV. So here we have our virus. This is the uh, circulated DNA covalently closed genome. And so these viral particles are infecting the epithelia. So we have proliferating viruses, and we have the productive infection with the release of new particles. So this is only infection. This is no disease. This is just infection by a virus, okay? When does it come the transformation? The transformation depends on a unique genetic event. That's a genetic accident that actually happens to the virus when the, the genome gets broken, exactly the E2 gene, which is actually the brake. If we imagine this as a car, there will be the brake, and then we have the accelerators, which are the E6 and E7. Those are the oncogenes. And this is the brake of E6 and E7 transcription. When the, when the virus integrates, the E2 gets broken, and then E6 and E7 are completely triggered, and then they get overexpressed. So then it appears the very first cell having a transformation, the integration of the virus and the overexpression of E6 and E7. And this is essential to have cancer. So this is the disease. We are going to detect the disease here, whereas this is only infection. Okay, this is what the point I want to stress out here. And we can have here the correlation to the uh, grade one, grade two, grade three, but you can have only an infection in scene one, scene two, or even scene three. But then you can have also a population of cells appearing here. So if we were able somehow to detect this population of cells, we would be able to detect disease, not only infection. And actually, this is such an accident that Cancer cells do not produce virus anymore. So they lose the L1 sometimes, we will see that later. They lose the expression of, many, of all the late genes. And in the end, they will have only E6 and E7, like very much overexpressed. And that's why this E6 and E7, they have all these synergistic interactions transforming the cells all the way to cervical cancer. But depending on that accident. All right? So the, the E6 and E7 mRNA overexpression will be a genotype-independent biomarker of precancer lesions. So we have this here, this bar here. So we have the first cells with the integration, uh, it's going on, and then comes the overexpression of E6 and E7, and then these cells start to proliferate and they start to substitute. Actually, they replace all the other cells until we have syn tree and also invasive carcinoma. And here you have, you see, so this is the DNA testing, that it's able to detect that much earlier because it detects infection, whereas these tests are detecting disease. And we have here something we will discuss later. Okay, now we move to this test. So this is Bruce Patterson, he's the inventor of this very uh, new test and uh, it's uh, based on mRNA or expression. He's professor at the, uh, he was professor at the University of Stanford and so we have collaborated with him in the development and implementation of several days of, of this test. So this is based on a thin prep or sure path, and uh, they direct probes against these oncogenic transcripts we're going to see, and then it's uh, done by flow cytometry. We will keep the entire cells, so the integer cells. We are not going to lyse the cells like the Optima does, in a way that we keep the right denominator, which is the integer cell. This allows us to define if the E6, E7 overexpression is coming for a small population of cells. And this is what we are going to detect. So the probes are directed against the E6, E7, which are the uh, oncogenic transcripts, which are found in advanced lesions. <coughs> so all the other splicing isoforms are not interesting because they, they could not uh, pro uh, make the cell progress to cancer. This is the case for e e HPV-16 and HPV-18. So these probes are internalized in the cells, and then they will bind to the mRNA, the expression of uh, the mRNA is expressed by E6 and E7, and then we will have a fluorescent marker, like having fluorescent cells uh, that we can detect by flow cytometry. 
So this is an example. We have here ectocervical cells. We have also endocervical cells that we can distinguish by the morphology. And then we can detect a population of cells overexpressing E6 and E7. In the new version of the test, we also have this HPV 3DX, where we have first a gate to um, identify this, uh, the, the epithelial cells, then the single nuclear cells, then we have the E6 and E7 overexpression, and on top of that, we can also have a look at the uh, proliferation phase using the cell cycle dye. So it's like having two tests in one because we'll look at proliferation and also E6 and E7 overexpression. <coughs> well, and here's the data. So this is the comparison to hybrid capture, the Cervista DNA test, the Optima, which is another RNA test that uh, it was discussed before by uh, some of the other speakers, and this is the Incel HPV Oncotect. So we have here in blue the sensitivity values. Are, you see is, they are all very similar ones, also the Incel DX. <coughs> but if we look at the specificity and the positive predictive values, so we have really, really uh, big difference in the numbers in favor of the HPV Oncotect. Uh, and this is a study out of uh, 600 samples. So this is a 600 biopsy study for the intended use in a general screening population. And here we have uh, other tests like the, the COVAS. And this is the negative predictive values. They are very similar. But if we have a look at the specificity, so we gain all the specificity with the incel DX. On contact. All right. So this is a study uh, directed by Dr. Rolando Herrera of the ERC. It's called the Stamper Project. So these guys have been behind uh, many of the most important studies of the uh, HPV vaccine. And well, he's Costa Rican, but he's working in France. And now they are doing this study. It's a multicentric study of cervical cancer screening and triage with HPV testing. And this will be done with 50,000 samples of patients in Central America. So we started testing the first 20 samples of the study. And here it was uh, the first 20 samples of Costa Rica. So they gave us 10 samples, 10 positive samples with a DNA test, positive, and 10 samples with a negative uh, DNA test. And what we have here is that uh, we have this case, for example, where you have a positive DNA test, but a negative integration. So you have viral infection, but you don't have integration. So this is infection. So we're looking at two different things, okay? One thing would be infection, and the other one would be disease. So this is only infection. So five out of 10 will have only infection, and will have no integration. This we expected, okay? This is what we expected, because this actually has much higher sensitivity, eh, specificity. But what really surprised us, out of 10 negative DNA tests, we found two positive. So having disease. So this is really a false negative. Okay? Well, so why these two false negatives? So the first thing was we went to the insert, COAS, so like the COAS uh, insert. And here we have a look at the numbers. If you see the sensitivity, for detecting SYN2 in uh, the, range, the age range from 21 to 29 years old, we have around 93%, okay? But if, and here we have like 100% in the range from 30 to 39, this is very nice. And we have, but it, this drops a lot when we go to uh, above 40 years old, it goes down to 66% of sensitivity. So we look at the age, also for SYN3, it goes down to 72%. And this is already on the ASCOS population, right? So this is what they're presenting in the COAS insert. If we go back to the Athena study, and we, have a, and we see the numbers directly of, of the general population of the study, we will see here the cytology, has a sensitivity around 40%, the HPV, we have like 69%, that's why all the other speakers will also say that HPV is much better than cytology, of course. But it's 69%, still very low. 
And if we go women over uh, 30 years old, it's like 64%, okay? So what is really happening there? And we, we thought we were discovering something new, but not. Many people have already reported that viral integration uh, comes frequently with the L1 deletion. So once the virus integrates the, and the uh, DNA must linearize, frequently we can have L1, the L1 region deleted. And guess what? Most DNA tests are directed against the L1 region. So we have a big risk for false negative results. So cryogen, for example, is how we capture. We have this is whole genome, right? But we go to COVAS, this is L1. Abbott is L1. Integrated Sciences is L1. Genera is L1 DNA. So that might be a problem. So now we go to the conclusions. I want to, to, um, to tell you this is, uh, now you're, we're talking very interestingly about the vaccination. Uh, now, right now in Costa Rica is taking place the SCUDO. Uh, this is uh, a study to compare the two doses against the one dose of the vaccine, indeed, to assess where one dose of the vaccine will be enough. So this is already ongoing in Costa Rica, and it's going to give uh, have very profound implications in vaccination programs worldwide. And this is the impact, the expected impact of the vaccine alone. It will be around 70% of prevention of cervical cancer deaths. This is the impact right now for the current PAP screening in the US, around 80%. But this is the impact of those of them together. So the one, what I want to tell you here is that the screening must continue in combination with the vaccine, at least for some time until we get this elimination of the virus. And we have different types of tests. We have the DNA test, they are based on these concession primers, consensus primers on the EU1, L1 gene. And we have several problems. We have amplification issues in samples with more than one genotype. They do not detect up to 25% of SYN2 lesions if no episomal DNA is present. So when the lesion is very high grade, very advanced, and the episomal DNA is no longer present, and it's very likely that we have a deletion or a mutation in the L1, then these tests are simply not going to detect it. So uh, uh, the first speaker was talking about DNA negative uh, cervical cancer. And that's actually, or HPV negative cervical cancer. That could be actually the case <coughs> because there is a deletion of the L1 gene in many, many cases. All right, and then on the other hand, we have the mRNA expression, which is used to detect the disease. And here we have high sensitivity and high specificity. So this is the proposed health algorithm together with the cytology. So if a woman it has these uh, types of uh, cytological report, and it has uh, <coughs> E6 and E7 overexpression, then this woman has to go to colposcopy, right? Here, for example. But if, if it's a negative one, uh, result, they, they, don't, they don't have to go to colposcopy. So they can retest everything in, in one year, for example. And that might be enough because she has a great probability that next time she comes, she will ha have everything negative. So this is detecting disease. We should be more interested in detecting disease than detecting infection by a virus. So this is the screen based on co-test of E6, E7 plus cytology. This could prevent about 50% of colposcopies, reduce costs on the healthcare system. This is the correct detection of pre-cervical cancer because it's not sensitive to L1 deletion. And it's the only test approved in women aged from 20 to 30 years old. Okay, this uh, test has the CE mark already in the EU and the ESR in the, uh, in the US. And it has been already performed about half a million assays worldwide, sold in the US, in Europe, Asia, India, Caribbean, and now Lebanon. And in Costa Rica, we will start very soon also that. We presented that twice in the National Congress of Gynecologists, and gynecologists love it because the algorithm is very simple. 
And of course, what is, could be the future of HPV testing and triage? So we think that in the future we can replace the pap smears and cytology uh, for this kind of testing, like it was shown also for the DNA, but uh, also by the RNA testing that it's more directed to detect disease and not only infection that could have absolutely no <coughs> clinical significance. So I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Professor Bruce Patterson and Dr. Rolando Herrero for the, for the support of the Stamper project, because now we are going to test, um, as we're starting with 1,000 samples of the Stamper project to also uh, have this test into these comparisons. And if everything goes fine, I mean, maybe we can do it also with the 50,000 samples. I want to thank my friends of the uh, Benta Pharma Industries for the nice invitation and my lab in Costa Rica. Uh, uh, here we have here with uh, uh, Luis Pasteur. Yeah, and since this Francophone um, Congress was taking place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, wanna I want to thank you for the uh, nice review and presentation and thank Beta for their uh, support. I um, want to hear some maybe comments from Mark, if you have any. Yeah, uh, indeed, this is, looks a, a promising test, but it, it's not yet on our list of validated tests. Uh, I think it would be good to sit together to see whether we can uh, set up studies or look the studies, what you have done already, and whether we can extract the evidence we need to put a new test on the list. I would be very so happy to see. So I would also like to have a closer look at your data. Uh, but for the moment, we recommend in Europe uh, to use only clinically validated tests. So for the moment, I observe that it is not yet there. So I think uh, we can sit together and look for the evidence you have and see uh, whether it fits uh, the criteria or whether research can be done in order to have it uh, validated or not. There are very some studies, so I, can, I would be very happy to share them with you. And also we hope to contribute with this Stamper project for the validation. So the, um, the CE is already there and it's almost 500,000 assays already performed. So we hope that very soon we could have also the FDA approved uh, version of that. Uh, I have a question. Have you used your test already on self samples? On which samples, sir? Self samples taken by the vaginal self samples taken by the women herself. No. no. Not that. So, so if we understand your, your algorithm now, you are supporting the use of this test as a triage test for those who have abnormal ASCUS low-grade uh, uh, lesion, right? Um, well, that would be a possible application, yes. But this test will have an equivalent sensitivity to uh, DNA-based testing. So we think that the right algorithm will be also for primary screening. So, but but do you of have course, we data? have to accumulate evidence, Wait. but Wait. Yeah, it, it all points out to this. So, yeah. my, my question to Mark, uh, we don't have long-term evidence to support the, the use in decreasing, actually, CIN1 and CIN2+. plus. Long-term, I mean, like we have for H, primary HPV testing. So, I think my question to yes. Mark, do you need, for this particular test, long-term data on CIN2 plus prevention to put this with the rest of the test? Or do you have algorithm for this new test that you can use to replace these long-term data? Because I think one cannot use a test for the, and claim it prevents CIN2 plus and 3 unless you have data like the COBAS, like Keogen. I have a question between the difference between COBAS and Keogen. Can you help us with these? Yeah, we have the Meyer guideline to validate HPV DNA tests. I have explained uh, what is the logic behind. Um, here we have an RNA-based test. Um, so indeed, we need to observe this low risk of future CN3 after uh, a test negativity with your test compared to one of the validated HPV DNA tests. Uh, this is what 
we need in Europe for screening um, in addition to uh, cross-sectional uh, non-inferior sensitivity and specificity in, in a cross-sectional uh, study. Um, but a specific test with good PPVs uh, is a priori a first candidate for a triage process. So I would first look in the data, but I must say I did not have sufficient time to look at all your data. I was looking also on a very uh, difficult angle, yeah. uh, but this would be my, my, my strategy if I was a test oh, developer with a, test, <laughs> with a specific test, first triage and next screening. So my, my, my next question is, now the, 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 the base for all comparison was the Kiagen, the hybrid capture two, where every test was compared to it. And as you said, it takes care of the whole genome, not the uh, Now, if, if COBAS does not you know, test for that, for the, they test for the L1, and since L1 is truncated in invasive cancer, how do you explain this, the specificity and sensitivity of the COBAS, since it does not detect the whole genome? Because this because, specificity... Because, you know, when they compared yeah. COBAS to Cleogen, yeah. they said it's an equivalent test. We know that by the, by the graph that he shows, there is, you know, overlap between the different tests. Yeah, there is low concordance, actually, between the different tests, also with the uh, high heart cap capture and the COBAS. And the point is that the, the sensitivity that is shown for the, for the COBAS is for the ASCUS population. So this means that it had to see already an ASCUS for both. from normal cytology. ASCUS. Yeah. No, the, co the COBAS was compared for near normal, the normal, and the ASCUS. Yeah, but if you have the, a look at the, the sensitivities study. of the general population of the study, they are very low. But if you see only the ASCUS subpopulation, they are, they are okay. Very nice numbers. For, uh, for HPV negative cancer, so yeah. the fact that the L1 is deleted, it may explain why this HPV negative cancer are HPV negative? Indeed. That is the explanation? Indeed. You agree, if, if Mark? They are not by you, you agree, Mark? Yeah, we do not know that fraction of HPV negative cancers, which is in fact HPV positive but negative, with an L1 PCR. Um, this is something <coughs> which we are studying. Um, we, we do not know yet. We don't believe that the fraction is very high, but it's sure it happens. There are other reasons why uh, you, you can have an HPV uh, negative cancer. You can have, there are cancers with a very low expression of HPV. Uh, it has been present some time ago, so it could have been detectable by a conventional HPV DNA test, but it has triggered carcinogenesis. And in the meanwhile, the viral load is very low. So you can only detect it with analytically very sensitive tests. Um, also, and probably the main reason is that a fraction of the HPV negative cancers are not cervical cancers. They are misqualified cancers. And we know that in particular certain uh, adenocarcinomas are not driven by HPV infection. So this is research. We have a protocol to do research on that. Uh, we hope to find funding. And uh, maybe we will find some uh, piece of evidence which uh, gives you a piece, uh, uh, an, an argument, which is now a, a molecular hypothesis, but which has been incorporated by first cross-sectional and mm. longitudinal. Data. Yeah, well, I would like to add something to this. Uh, so we, other people have already reported that. But we also have, uh, from the Stampa samples, we look for those and try to sequence to see this, what is the, the frequency of deletions, actually. So we yeah. want to generate that evidence. Yeah. A very practical question, Dr. Mora. You yes. seem to be promoting, or you, you would like to promote the use of this test for primary screening rather than cytology. Do you have any data to support every how often yeah, no. you would Can do the screening if you want to use this test for primary screening rather than cytology? There is cumulative evidence, so at, that's why we have this TAMPA project, 
So we would like to start comparing with this other test, like direct. So although Bruce Patterson had already done some other studies that I would be happy to share with you. So um, it was not intended in the beginning for primary screen. It was actually intended to be a triage uh, method at the very beginning. But since we started to see that the sensitivity is also very high, so if I had to choose between a DNA method and this RNA-based method because of uh, budget, I would for sure go for the RNA because you are detecting disease and you have the same sensitivities compared to the other methodologies. So that's why we're going to try to promote in the future and uh, we believe that it could be in the future that the, the, this test could be actually part of the primary screen.